So let's get started. Welcome everyone uh, to this uh, special session of the seminar philosophy held on a Tuesday. Uh, from our usual schedule, but that's because this allows us to have a special guest today, uh, Dr. Derek Au uh, from Chinese University of uh, Hong Kong and my, my former boss there. So Derek is the ex-director of the uh, CUHPA Center uh, for Bioethics at the Chinese University of Hong Kong, and he's the current honorary uh, advisor of the center. Uh, he's received medical education at Brown University, and postgraduate training in Hong Kong. He has served in clinical geriatric and rehabilitation services for two decades before taking up administrative positions at the uh, hospital authority. Hong Kong, uh, where he was director of quality and safety uh, for two years, and uh, that his portfolio included overseeing clinical ethics, uh, research ethics, and technology assessment. And in public service, Dr. Rao, Eric has uh, formerly served on the ethics committee of the Medical Council of Hong Kong, and is currently the convener of the ethics advisory committee of the Hong Kong. Genome Institute. So it has a very uh, substantial uh, background uh, that we're going to benefit uh, from today uh, with this talk. On a, on a personal note, uh, I have to say uh, so my, my years in Hong Kong, uh, Chinese University, coincided with uh, Derek's years as a director of the Biotech Center, and I can truthfully say that I have many, many uh, fond memories of that period. I'm always uh, to remember with nostalgia, uh, including, for example, our joint trips to Yamcha restaurants around uh, <laughs> the university or around the center. Uh, and uh, I, I remember, among others, uh, our trips to the uh, Hong Kong Science Park, which is located close to the university, where they have a nice Yamcha restaurant, which has the added bonus of having robots uh, bringing the dishes and taking them away. Which um, one of the mem my memorable memories of Hong Kong is maybe a few years time, it's just didn't know everywhere. Uh, robots make a meal, but back then it was time ago. Had a very special experience. And hopefully, this last point uh, leads me nicely to very study for the talk, which is on the doctor AI patient relationship. So it's not, not just about robots, but generally speaking. Uh, the application of AI in medical care. Uh, so, Derek, we are very happy and honored to have you with us today, and welcome to the seminar. So, uh, thank you, Mary, for that uh, kind introduction. Uh, I'm back in Taipei uh, after three years. Last time I was here for a biomedical ethics conference. And of course, a lot has happened in three years. It's a different world now, uh, in many ways. Uh, so we're happy to be here to be meeting Eric and also some meeting some new friends. Uh, this is my first time in Yangming University, uh, and I understand Yangming uh, has just merged with the Jiang uh, So the title here is not quite correct. <laughs> I've not put Jiang uh, in the title. Uh, uh, Wang Yangming is also one of my favorite. Chinese uh, philosopher, so, so we're very happy to be uh, here in Yang University. Uh, the topic I'm going to talk about is uh, doctor AI patient relationship uh, because uh, Alex told me that I should speak on something uh, having to do with AI interface with people and okay, not just the generic AI issue. So, this is the topic that I've chosen uh, to share with you today. Uh, the abstract gives a sense of what the talk would be about. Uh, it looks more coherent than it will actually be because AI by nature, I think the subject matter is not a coherent uh, subject. You, if you try to, to, to deliver a talk or write a paper comprehensively on AI issues, that would be a very dry and empty paper, it's so general, okay? So this looks more coherent than 
uh, it would actually be. You, you may con conceive the lecture as to be roughly in two parts. Uh, the first part, I'm going to talk about uh, something in the general aspects of doctor-patient relationship, and also the general aspect of AI ethics and governance. Okay, so quite general. The second part, I'm going to uh, touch on some selected areas uh, in AI as being a uh, venture and trial in healthcare. Uh, so to give a sense of what the real issues and questions are being discussed. Okay, still that would not be comprehensive, but it is a sense of the general uh, issues and also some particular specific tension. I often started uh, talks on AI uh, saying something about the hype uh, uh, of AI, the sort of over commerce uh, fashion uh, talk of AI. And this is uh, one piece of news uh, from 2017. Uh, by the way, about five years ago uh, from now, that was the high point of AI. That was the time that the whole world thinks that AI will come quickly to help get the medicine and change the landscape and do lots of revolutionary things. So that was the high point of AI in healthcare. Okay, and this was one of the examples to illustrate. It was a time when uh, an AI passed, actually passed the National Medical License Exam in mainland China. Okay? Similar things has happened in the UK as well. They have used AI to, to take the uh, membership examination of the World College. Uh, so people have obviously tried different things. And I call this a type because the over promise that once you have AI that can pass examination, then you can have AI as a doctor. Of course, we know that it's not that simple right? for many reasons, not just regulatory reasons, but also real reasons of what doctor patient relationship is actually about. It's not just about the book knowledge. Okay, so, so, this is an example of the mother for the hype. Of AI in medicine. The first time that I was invited to give a talk on AI in medicine was uh, uh, three years ago. Uh, I was invited to talk to the uh, Common College of Community Medicine, uh, all doctors uh, interested in primary care, general care. Okay. And I chose the topic at the time as the first look at artificial intelligence in healthcare. And the question I asked was whether AI is going to be of men can doctor's role in medicine, or whether it will be sabotaging or disrupting, we call disruptive innovation, right? Disrupting the whole landscape of medicine. So I was exploring that question at the time. And there's a reason why at the time I decided to look at this topic, because at the time the American Medical Association just issued a, an ethics statement uh, on the position of the American Medical Association saying that AI should not be in medicine, should not be artificial intelligence. It should be augmented intelligence for doctors. So AI augmented intelligence. Right? That is the hope of the professionals of AI in medicine. So I use that as a sign point to say, what would it look like? Would it look like augmentation only? Or would it be disruption? of the healthcare system. So uh, that was the sign point of my thinking uh, on this topic. It looked a lot more like disrupting the time. Uh, I, I mentioned some of the examples later. All right. But before I move on to AI, I want to say a few words about doctor-patient relationship. Okay, not AI, just uh, doctor patient relationship. Uh, and today I will make it, be making references on on doctor on AI and doctor patient relationship in triangle. Okay, uh, all these three papers uh, in within the past three years. So this is a relatively new focus in AI and healthcare. Doctor patient relationship has impacted by AI or which you see the title something you already begin to say doctor patient AI relations and doctor patient relationship with AI. Okay, so you see a triangle appear. Uh, but I 
when I, I thought of this topic for today, I didn't know that at the time I didn't know that people are really currently discussing this topic. So I just happened to think about what people are actually discussing. Okay, so I'm using some of these as references for today's uh, presentation discussion. But as I said, uh, first going back a little in time to talk about the DPR, the first DPR is doctor vision relationship. Uh, this goes back to 1992, a classic paper uh, is by Emmanuel and some of you probably know uh, S.P. Emmanuel, quite a renowned uh, uh, person in medical ethics, and he's actually one of the national advisors in the States in pandemic ethics uh, at present time, so quite so effective. Uh, so at the time they wrote this type of paper, talk about the four models of the physician patient relationship. And it was mentioned that in the last two decades, that's from the 70s, 70s actually, the struggle over the patient's role in medical decision making that is always called, often characterized as a conflict between autonomy and health and between the value of the patient and the value of the decision. So uh, some of you who may know a bit about the history of bioethics would know that bioethics really was born in the 70s uh, when society is waking up to the fact that many issues like euthanasia, dialysis, resource allocation issues are not exclusively professional medical issues. Okay, so you need humanistic perspective, you need society to debate on social political aspects and the philosophers came in Think about the principles of bioethics. So the 70s to the 90s were the two golden decades when bioethics talked about lay bioethics and also professional medical ethics. So, okay, so this, 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 this was the backdrop of the idea that these two uh, bioethicists or philosophers they came up with a suggestion that we look, need to look at four models of physician patient relationship or doctor patient relationship. Now, the two of the models you are probably familiar with, uh, when we talk about doctor patient relationship, we often talk about paternalistic uh, model, like Jia Zhang Zhu Yi, just treating doctors as you know, parents making decisions for children. As benevolent uh, person or children. And the of course, the modern concept is to, to treat the patient as an independent decision making person. So it becomes an informative model. So the two polarized models are easy to understand. Okay? The other two models are sort of in, intermediate uh, compromise to try to make a balance between doctors as advisors and also patients as independent decision makers, okay? So the four models will be paternalistic, informative, interpretive, interpretative, and deliberative. Uh, interpretative basically means that when the patient says something, say, doctor, I don't want this surgery. I have lived long enough, okay? I don't want this curative surgery. Then the doctor will not just let the patient alone design, okay? The doctor will try to interpret what the patient is actually saying. Are you saying that you don't want to take the risk? Or are you saying that you really feel sad about living on? You want to explore the patient's actual thinking emotion, so you just interpret it, okay? The deliberative is one more step further, that is the doctor decides interpreting or the patient also tries to enlighten the patient and to what is actually in his or her best interest. Okay, so the doctor is not just throwing the information to the patient, but also helping to give the patient something positive as advice to deliberate uh, the decision making process. There's a Chinese, I found in Wikipedia, a Chinese version of the four, <laughs> four models. And I think this is probably the different uh, common translation. So, uh, I call it Zha Zhang Zhu Yi in this because Fu Chen was uh, interpretative and deliberative and also inform, inform, informative. So uh, in, in Chinese uh, translation, it's like that. Why am I taking this long 
route to talk about the basic information relationship because I think most of the recent literature when they talk about how AI comes into the third party between doctor and patient to say doctor AI uh, patient relationship, I think they have not really addressed the fact that there's no one single existing relationship between doctor and patient. Okay, so you cannot assume that doctor relationship is a very static, clearly delineated uh, relationship, and then a third person comes in, and then you have a triangle. You talk about really, it's not like that because the present state of doctor relationship is quite fluid. Uh, and involvement uh, in the past few decades. So you have to start with the understanding that when you talk about AI coming in, you have to first ask coming into what? Okay? Is it coming into a relationship where the patient is treated as an autonomous agent to make a decision, or are you treating patients as just a receiver of the best advice? Okay? That's the trick. If you treat the patient as just a receiver of best advice, then the question is just, how to inform the patient about the AI, okay? But if you talk about patients still being an independent agent, then you have to ask the question of how the patient would relate to the AI survive, okay? So it becomes a different kind of question. But today we don't have time to get into all these combinations. I just want to uh, let you have a background idea that when you talk about really the triangle, think first about what are the assumptions of the author about the patient relations before they talk about the triangle, because that's the whole point I'm talking about. Okay, now we are back to the uh, sort of the triangular relationship, and the next few slides I'll show you the positive views. Okay, uh, I sometimes question simple, the uh, simple-minded views of how AI will benefit the uh, patient uh, relationship and the patient benefit, and you see. Uh, in this paper, often in these kind of articles, they will phrase the issue as AI being part of a smart health chain, okay? because healthcare is now enriched and really is being enriched by technology and AI. So you can, you know, there's AI now, information science, and other things going to that's it. So smart healthcare is quite, quite a, a jargon uh, in uh, modern healthcare people who are positive about the future of technology. So these people, they would uh, think that AI will certainly accelerate and enhance the diagnostic process. It will personalize information because the AI will be able to decipher or get information about the person individually uh, to give personalized information. So we have heard about the, the holy grail or the vision of personalized medicine right, in the future. Uh, so AI will be part of this to become part of the personalized medicine. And of course, it can be a digital tool. It can also be used for assessing risk of serious disease and medical communication. If you have a patient with depression, one of the challenges of the psychiatrist is how do you know whether the patient is suicidal or has suicidal risk? Uh, and of course, you can use professional skill. My first job in Hong Kong was in psychiatry as a young doctor. So Part of the job was to assess patient's risk uh, of serious depression or suicide, suicidal risk. And presumably, if you have AI who is accessible to the patient's whole reservoir of conversations, including social media, right, then you can use AI to find out who has the suicidal risk and then to do some So that's the helpful part of it. In the COVID battle, uh, presently, there are a lot of con contemporary research in this area trying to use AI. Because in COVID, as you know, most people have mild diseases. Perhaps like 10% have significant symptoms, and perhaps 1% or less will have critical care ventilation and serious complications. But how do you know who is going to get to the uh, highest risk candidate? Uh, so people have been trying to use AI from the thousands and millions of cases to see if they can predict uh, the patient. So you can use it for that effort. It has not worked. <laughs> Disappointingly, lots of those research simply went to waste. 
Okay, I, if I will tell you, can talk about that later on. It, it didn't work in this case, but presumably it can be applied in this kind of area. And you can use it for patient self control and compliance. Right? You know, the people are using wearables. Right? You can use wearables to monitor your own power, blood pressure, right? even your cardiac rhythm. Uh, you can use wearables to nowadays with you can you can monitor your diabetic vessel control and things so so you can use that combined with AI to become a sort of day-to-day -day health advisor to the patient. So here's are the enthusiastic views of the application. And if you look at uh, UK, okay, uh, UK as you know runs a national health service the NHS system, which is a, a tax base funded mostly uh, public hospital and primary care system. Okay? And UK is very, very upbeat in using AI in future in healthcare. So this is, they came out with this uh, really quite well written uh, report uh, on AI in the NHS in 2018. Remember I told you 2017, 2018 was the time when people are very enthusiastic about AI in changing the landscape of medicine. In this report, you see from the, the, the uh, content, you would notice that they talk about uh, using AI to augment the cognitive capacity of the doctors, improve diagnosis, treatment, uh, right interventions, free administrative time, chronic disease management, and self management. So, a bit similar to the last slide, so they were very visionary to say NHS is ready and committed to move to this direction. But I really wanted you to look at the next uh, focus, and that is how they think they can implement AI in healthcare. And they just say two things: they thought that you just need to make AI trustworthy, okay, and also to solve the data sharing issue because AI you have to do machine learning, you have to feed in lots of data. Perhaps without patient's full consent for the machine to learn. So they thought it's a it's like it's like almost like a technical solution to implement to say, oh, if we can solve the data sharing issue, if we can get the patients to buy in and become trustworthy, then AI will be implemented in health without problem. You can see the slightly naive and simple-minded. Uh, positive future, uh, even in the NHS, which is quite a sophisticated uh, health organization. So that reflects uh, how people who are positive minded uh, are thinking about AI in medicine. This is the last example uh, in education radiology. Uh, radiology is interesting because there are two areas of AI which is, is advancing so far. One is because the AI most of it is pattern recognition with uncertain complicated situations, right? So, diagnosis of radiologists, you, you can use AI to learn to read X rays and CT scans and MRI scan imaging. The, if you feed in enough images for it to learn the correct diagnosis, it will actually spot abnormalities that human eyes may not be able to, to spot. And you don't even know the logic of it because it simply recognizes certain patterns to be associated with certain so, so AI in diagnostic radiology, it was the, one of the most promising in 2017. Uh, one of the promising areas of AI quickly making an impact. Uh, so much so that a guru, uh, someone who's in innovative technology in Silicon Valley, in, 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 in the state, he made a statement and said, we are now so good with AI uh, in radiology that it is as good or better than the average radiologist in reading uh, X-rays and scans and imaging. So he said, "Oh, and hope we should stop training radiologists, okay? Because in ten years' time, AI can just come over and, and take over, okay? So that was how you know how the mood was like at the time. This paper is more reasonable." And more sensible, but you can still see that it sees that the promise of AI is its potential to release decisions on tasks that are better performed by automation. So 
it is again hoping for AI to augment uh, the professional service. And the idea is that if you can use the AI to read the really boring x rays and time, then the results can be released, release the time to be more patient sensor to work with patients. Uh, I, I have been healthcare for a long time and I have heard this kind of promise before when we computerize management systems. Like 10 years ago, 10 years ago, we began to computerize the clinical management system. And we will say when we have the computers, everything is so efficient, doctors will have a lot of time to speak to patients. No, doctors have all the time stepping the computers and also typing, typing, typing. <laughs> we don't have time. I, I, I was still in clinical medicine when this revolution came about and I type quite well, I can blind type. Uh, it's still very difficult to talk to patients in a caring manner and cope with the computer at the same time. So, and also, the modern uh, uh, world of efficiency is like this. If you can do the same job with the computer or whatever AI technology, then they expect you to do more. Okay? If you can do 10 medical reports in one day manually, and you can do 20 with the, the uh, computer system, then they expect you to do 20. Okay, so, so, so you, so, so this, I, I think this is, I just feel quite simple minded. Okay, so the next part, uh, I'm going to move on now a bit more to really actual ethics area, but this is still in the general uh, first part. This is the last last piece of this first uh, general first half of my talk. And this is a W report on ethics and governance of AI for health is quite recent. It was published last year. It's a really well written report. So if you start to do work in this area. I think this is a good starting point uh, to look at the subject because it's not too tight, not too optimistic. It's really look at the issues quite earnestly. Okay? But I won't go into the detail because it's quite a long detail report. I just want to get a feel for what it's like. So, so the uh, WHO report identified, uh, uh, identified six consensus principles to ensure air work to the public benefits of, of all countries, and it has a set of recommendations uh, for this purpose. Okay, so, so here are the six core principles. If you have been in the field for AI ethics, you can decide them probably by heart already. Uh, it talks about protecting autonomy, promote well-being and public interest, and ensure transparency, explainability, and intelligibility. I'll come to that in a minute. Uh, also responsibility and accountability and sure inclusiveness and equity and global AI that is responsible and sustainable. The first and last one are quite uh, quite generic. Okay. Of course you want to respect autonomy, of course we want the system to be responsive and sustainable. The middle uh, four principles are quite special to AI and there's some some substantial issues to do with. And as I said I don't want to go into this report in detail but uh, want to help you to have a, a sense of what they talk about. The first thing, the first thing they talk about autonomy, the thing to note is that they are not talking about individual autonomy in the usual sense. Okay? They are talking about autonomy of the human. Okay? They are talking about when AI comes in and helps them, medicine, we don't want it to take over it completely and we want to maintain human autonomy as a whole in implementing AI in medicine. Okay, so so it's not talking about individual autonomy in the user sense. Of course it also covers data privacy things but I think that's the uh, thing to know about autonomy in this report. The uh, second part uh, it was talking about uh, protecting the subjects. Okay. Uh, that you need to have measures of quality control in the use of AI to make it available over time. Note how this is phrased, the word that is said, it should be made available over time. Okay? It is acknowledging that this is difficult to achieve. Okay? It's not something you just write a guideline and then you can implement. Okay? You want to implement AI and you want to make sure that AI implemented is not garbage in garbage now. 
So you want to make sure the quality is okay. And how do you do that? It's not easy to do that because AI is such a black box many times. So how do you actually control the quality? The AI is, it, it gets to be really bad algorithms, which you know. Okay, so we want to use iPhones and uh, smartphones now, and sometimes now we are forced to update the iOS and things. And when, once you're in the blue moon, the iOS is really bad. Okay, it has started problems, and you can do nothing because it, it just requires you to use it. And how do you then know that the AI is of good quality? So, so that is the focus on uh, public interest and human safety uh, regarding. Uh, quality control. The effect is talked about a lot in uh, AI in many subjects, but in AI, you might say in particular. Uh, the key concern is how do you make it understandable to the patient or even the doctors? Okay, if you have now an AI algorithm that will say, help the doctors to make smart decision making for their patient, how does the doctor know? The thinking logic of the AI because there's no thinking logic. AI machine learning by nature is not a logical kind of flow. You can't draw a logical path to know how the how the AI analyze the situation. So, so the question is, how do you ensure the transparency, accountability, and accessibility? And there are two different approaches. One is to improve the transparency. That's when you design AI. It transparent at each stage. How do you work with the algorithm? How you design the algorithm? To at least make the engineering process transparent so that you know what you're doing. Okay, that's the transparency. But transparent does not mean that it's explainable. Okay, I open up all the technical transparent steps. It doesn't mean that the doctor or the patient understand what's going on. It's still a different level. So making it explainable is another huge challenge. There are some, uh, some studies which are suggesting that if you require an AI designer to be very transparent in every step, then the AI does not learn to, to master the complicated things so well. Because you're using the human mind to structure and tier the design process, and it's not the logic that the AI system is learning. So it is a, a, a conflict or a potential tension between Expectation of making it transparent and trainable, and also making the AI really smart and creative. Okay, so this is a problem that's not yet uh, well solved. Uh, for one, I think you can imagine uh, when something goes wrong, who is responsible? The doctor, AI, and the patient. Something goes wrong. They, I will mention in the, in the second part of the talk that some example. Uh, who will be accountable? How will they be accountable? Okay. Would it be the, mach the machine won't be accountable? So would it be the designing programmer person or would it be a health administrator who decide to automate the process? Who, who would be accountable? So this is also this is an area that is talked a lot uh, about in when you talk about law and ethics in AI. Okay, so when people talk about law and ethics, uh, not so abstract, not so Philosophical, then this is probably the number one uh, question that people would want to talk about. Uh, this part, uh, sorry, uh, the first one is a, a well known one that AI, because you feed in data for it to learn, you can have bias. And there has been many cases of such bias in particular the state. Uh, if you feed in certain data, you imagine certain data to find uh, which patients are more likely to have HIV infections, more likely to have violent tendency in mental illness. And if you the data, you'll find that black people would be more likely to have this uh, undesirable trait because the society is unjust in the first place. Society is not fairly treating this population. So when you feed in the data, it looks like the black people are intrinsically more violent and so on. So you can have data bias in different ways, also in healthcare. Uh, there has been uh, bias in the other way, that is you feed in all the data and find that the AI cannot make diagnosis black people. 
because all the data are mostly from healthy, not, not well off uh, white population who can afford health care. Okay, so so you don't have representation in none of the uh, black population. So this is an issue talked about a lot in the states uh, and in countries where there's multi ethnic groups and problems with inequalities. The last one I talked about uh, sustainable, but I also mentioned in the report in this context, we talked about sustainability not just to the environment, but also at the workplace. If you introduce AI in the workplace, does the workplace, can the workplace sustain its mode of work? Uh, it has happened, I use the analogy of the computerization uh, system. Uh, in Hong Kong, we're barely able to cope with the computerization, but in some countries, the so-called automation, computerized management system has caused lots of disruptions to the place and it's not, and can also lead to potential job loss in certain uh, uh, healthcare professionals. Okay, uh, that was the first part, the general uh, overview of the doctor patient relationship and also the general ethics and governance issues of AI. The uh, next part is more, more focused. Okay? The next part, uh, I want uh, to bring your attention. This is really uh, uh, also quite a well written report, uh, uh, just published uh, uh, in June this year. It's a report commissioned by the Council, European Council, uh, and uh, written by a scholar in Oxford. Uh, the, this one is different from the WTO because it is more, more on guard, it's more cautious of the impact of AI on human rights and also on patients' rights. Okay, so the tone, the focus is much more uh, uh, cautious. So uh, it says a radical conservative circulation, uh, it does not seem like uh, it will happen right away. You know, I said in 2017, of course, the landscape will change very quickly. But now the conclusion is no, we don't think the landscape will change that quickly uh, in, in AI and in medicine. But, it will, it will be, uh, it will be transforming the doctor patient AI relationship. So you see, they're using the term that I'm using today, uh, doctor AI patient or doctor patient AI relationship. And the challenge is on to ensure the standard, to make sure that the patient's interest and the moral integrity of medicine as a profession are not fundamentally damaged. So it is aware of the potential impact on the effect of AI that may erode the professional integrity in healthcare. Okay, so this is something that WHO report is not uh, so much uh, addressed. And uh, I'm going to uh, just let you have a glance of what are the uh, issues that this report uh, shows to give you a sense that is quite on that or aware of the impact on skilling people, uh, on making uh, professionals become less able to do diagnosis and to rely on the machine. This actually happens in the present uh, healthcare system uh, in some different ways. When I was a doctor in the front line, we take blood for patients by ourselves. Now we have the bottomless uh, condition to have to take blood and start IV drips. Uh, for patients in the hospital. And now doctors cannot do the blood taking so, so well. Okay, so you do have problems of the skill, uh, losing the skill because of the, the help from technology and others. And AI can certainly uh, blunt uh, public doctors' uh, decision making in some way. Uh, so it was covering on this uh, issues that would be challenges. And the, it phrased quite well the issue of transparency and informed consent. And the question asked is, is explainability, right? How should such systems explain themselves or be explained both to doctors and patients? So this is really the key question now in, in bedside medicine when you introduce AI. I, in the process of preparing for the talk, I came across this, this paper, which I wasn't aware of before. Uh, this is written uh, by a law scholar, okay, not ethics, law scholar, who looked at the informed consent process with medical AI. 
and we ask certain questions, which the specific questions which are quite interesting, uh, that and I have not thought so sharply about, so I want to share them with you. Uh, the, this article is the first article to examine in depth how medical AI and machine learning will intersect with our concept of informed consent. You know, informed consent, you need to tell the patient the risk and benefit of the procedure. That's a basic requirement, right? But when AI comes into medicine, it may not be about one particular surgical procedure. It could be about very broad general medical decision-making advice. So the question is, how do you inform the patient about the role of the AI in the decision-making process? Okay, number one, that's the medical decision-making part. And secondly, if you are actually performing a procedure, you know that now some surgeons are performed with robot, robotic surgery, right? So you can do prostate surgery with robotic assist device. And the new generation of the so-called Da Vinci robotic technology is, has AI components. So, so the, the machine is not just helping you to have steady hands to do fine things. It's also helping the doctors to decide on under the situation, should you go deeper or should you hold on to something, what do you do? So it will actually help doctors to navigate the complex medical procedure, the, the current developments like that. So this raised two questions, okay? Um, one, sorry, uh, it's a sequence issue. So um, one of the questions being asked is, if you have doctor and AI treating the patient, how do you disclose information about the AI's credentials? Okay, if you, I'm a doctor, I treat you, I have a medical license. I'm a specialist in cardiology, I have certificates and qualifications in that, okay? If you use the AI system to help cardiologists to advise on heart problems, okay, or a cancer oncologist to advise on cancer problems, what is the qualification of the AI? Okay. You can say it's IBM, you can say it's Google, it is some company, but that's not qualification. So how does the patient get me sure that the AI has the proper standard of qualification? Okay, so it's, it's, so you can imagine this is now making an analogy between informed consent with human and informed consent with AI being part of the treatment provider. Okay, that's facing the question in general. The second question is more interesting. The same question is if you actually do a surgery procedure, it often happens you have a professor in surgery, he's very busy, he works on a number of surgeries in one morning and he Work on it for the first, first half, the typical part, get it done, and then the assistant surgeon will help finish up, and then, and then he can move on to the next theater to do on the next patient, right? It happens a lot. Uh, and sometimes you can even have a, a very senior doctor just get the patients under started, and then have another doctor surgeon to take over, as it is called post surgery. You know, the, the professor is not actually present, uh, he, he for something more important, and then someone will work on it. In, in real life, the patient should have the right to know that who is actually operating on me. Right? If you have doctor assisted by Dr. B, then I should know that the Dr. B will be also operating on me. But if you have AI uh, surgical uh, assistance to the doctor, do you need to inform the patient that part of your surgery is AI performed? Uh, and then it also like the qualification uh, issues. So this uh, this paper is interesting because it looks from the medical legal perspective, it's not just the law perspective. And the conclusion and the conclusion is that it is difficult to argue that failure to, to disclose the lines of AM requires a form of informed consent because passing informed consent is so it does not require the doctor to say anything about the AI when AI is part of the decision-making process of surgery conducting process. So 
But what about professional ethics? I think ethics and law here may not be uh, speaking uh, eye to eye on this case. So uh, it is a, a, a new issue uh, in this case. Uh, I, I skip one slide, just go back and tell you one case. In, uh, you know, I said AI can be used for risk detection. Okay, uh, uh, just now. And this is a paper published in Lancet, a really good medical journal uh, of doctors using AI to help them to, to identify the risk of the patient having HIV. Okay, so if you have a patient's medical record based on the sexual history, the patient's uh, maybe profession and other traits, young age, ethnic groups, and other things, I don't know the AI use contact logic. You can probably predict which patient is likely to contract to suffer from HIV infection in future. So you can accordingly recommend the patient to have prophylaxis for HIV. It looks like a well-intentioned kind of study, but when it's published, it raises a lot of eyebrows and questions. Uh, it's very sensitive information that you put a label on me to say that I'm at risk of having HIV, but I don't know your logic. You say you have AI, you look at my stuff, and then you say I have high risk for HIV. Uh, so from the patient's point of view, it's not acceptable. So it's a very well intended paper that turns out into seven five hundred words or so. This is use an example to to again talk about your informed consent when you use the patient's data to do something for this purpose. The patient is our patient. So uh, so that was the example that was causing uh, the And lastly, uh, the last part of my talk, uh, there's just two uh, areas I'm going to talk to. Uh, anyone has heard of IBM Watson uh, in AI? IBM uh, Watson uh, in 2016, okay? Again, I said 2017 was the hype period. Uh, around that time, the IBM Watson AI was able to beat the best competitor in a TV game called Jeopardy. That is like answering encyclopedic questions, really hard questions, and the yeah, other they would be the best champion in Jeopardy. Just play a 10 line use in time. And then they say now we are moving Watson AI into oncology. Uh, now in oncology, you know cancer can be staged in a different stages. Okay? And then each stage you will have different treatment protocol. But there can be different protocols for the same stage. And some people prefer this, some or the other. And patients, depending on their own health condition, may respond well to one protocol and not the other protocol. Okay? So, so in oncology, there's, there's always a question of who should be getting what treatment at what time to get the best result. This is a real clinical question. Okay? So what's in trying to attack this patient, patient and it collaborated uh, with some of the best cancer centers in the state and promised that we will find out which patients are, uh, are, should be recommend more optimal treatments. And as a standard of testing, in 216, they announced that we are close to success because AI is able to recommend same treatment as doctors in 99% of the cancer cases. So, is as good as like the doctor's recommendation in the best sense. This is like really big news at the time, and people think that now we have the AI decision to, to help us. So, uh, back a little bit, it entered into uh, collaboration. You know, Long Kittering Institute, Mayo Clinic are really the top. That's two centers in cancer treatment in the state and other Johnson Johnson and other companies. So optim optimistic times and and the and in two oh uh, in two oh two one this is from last year the project went into total failure. Okay, so after five no, more than five years, after almost 10 years of investing 
the money and energy so it, it didn't work okay and in the end in the end the outcome in january this year ibm watson went from the future of healthcare to so off for cars so they're taking the watson apart and sell the bits and pieces as like like a spare part or no the as a part to close the eventually it's a high investment uh, for IBM and a big disappointment for this center. Two things uh, seem to have happened uh, in, in this case. Okay? Uh, one, if you gather the best treatments from the best doctors and the patients from the center and you use the same, you use that developed algorithm in a new hospital. Because the new hospitals have a different way of entering medical records. And they have new hospitals have a different population under treatment. Okay. So once you move this well-developed algorithm into another place, it simply does not work. Okay, because the whole contextual environment is different. Okay, so it's not things are not generic. Okay. It's, and, and it depends, and secondly, it, it depends a lot of people surfing the AI with a lot of good data for it to learn. Okay? And if this strong killing mail clinic, they have this system to do that. But if you do it in Hong Kong, I don't know about Taiwan, uh, doctors write really bad medical, but not really bad, really, I mean, tell you all medical doctors scribble and then everyone. Uh, and then you let the machine learn how does the machine learn. Even you type into the kinetic management system, the quality cannot be controlled. Okay, so so it's really one part is garbage in, garbage out. Second is the failure to move the algorithm into a new environment to have different environment. That, by the way, also happens in diagnostic oncology. You learn, you teach the machine to learn to to read X-ray and CT scans and MRI scans and move to another hospital, suddenly the hospital is using a different machine. And then the whole appearance of the detail will be different. Okay? And it has happened as a, a, a bit of a joke. Uh, at one point, the AI was learning to make diagnosis based on the brain of the machine, the X-ray machine. Because it noticed that in this machine associated, it happens to have more, for instance, uh, to, uh, uh, cancer cases of the lung. The other machine has less. So whenever patients take a picture of the machine, they thought that it has a higher risk of cancer uh, because the picture looks different uh, of the two machines. So, so because you don't know the algorithm and you move to different uh, situations, then the whole thing collapsed. Okay, so this is a, a case, it's become now a learning case of the hurdles of using uh, uh, AI sensor. And uh, finally, uh, the uh, European Parliament uh, also uh, came out with a study in 2020, and, and it has, I think, time is running out, so I won't go into the uh, details, but in this report, it mentioned a few specific cases of AI's failing expectations and causing problems. Uh, for instance, a surgical robot in hospital to develop malfunction during prostate surgery and injury with patient. Uh, uh, and uh, a, a protection by using AI was having industrial injury. And uh, Tesla, uh, you may have heard of this, uh, has caused an accident, uh, harm causing a death of the patient. So, embodied AI in trouble was mentioned. Report. So the question raises when the equipment uh, can be proven to be faulty uh, by the manufacturer, then, then you can sue the manufacturer. But it's often tricky, difficult to decide uh, uh, who is actually responsible and what is the problem. And I mentioned the robotic surgery, Da Vinci assistant, and there has been lawsuits against. The Vinci system, but the robot is still quite popular. So, so we haven't solved the problem, and uh, we're still 
time the technology. The next question is uh, having to do with mental health. I go directly into uh, mental health for the, uh, in the interest of time. Uh, I, I mentioned in the beginning that AI was first enthusiastically used in dinosaur technology. Personally, it's enthusiastically being used in mental health. Okay. And I think this has the part which has something to do with what your institute may be interested in, in the mind and also the authenticity issue and others. So I'll just say a few words about uh, mental health care. And body artificial intelligence are now being tried uh, in psychiatry, psychology, and psychotherapy. Okay, so this is a paper in 2019. So, two years later, actually, there's quite a number of projects actually already embarking on that. Uh, three years ago, I thought this is not going to happen because it's so sensitive to work on psychiatric or mental health patients, but people have actually ventured into the area. So, I was wrong uh, in my reading of the uh, landscape. So you can now use a chatbot. You know chatbot, the uh, robots will talk to you. Uh, work over short text, texting messages, and ready to do a virtual cybertherapy. And this is actually uh, being used by Google. Uh, uh, so you know, on online people are sharing text, social media, Instagram, and, and Facebook. They can use Facebook and also the Signal and other uh, tweeters. Uh, so. You can use AI to monitor the flow of these texting messages and quite easy to identify who are the really distressed, depressed, gloomy people and what they are talking about and, and how serious the, you know, the depression is. So people are using the uh, algorithm to help identify who is at risk of depression for a screen and require screening and purpose. This is more controversial. Uh, you know Abraham, the, the movie uh, of you know, virtual, let's say people living in the virtual world. Uh, the AI and avatar projects are now actually being tried out in mental health. That is, you can use, you can allow the patient to have a virtual identity in the virtual world. And then interact with a virtual mental health person or professional counselor or coach or somebody. And if the patient has illusions or hallucinations, they can act out the issue. I, if I think the CIA is always after me, then the online coach can help interact with you and be your imagined CIA and, and then and then advise and counsel you in the virtual world. Okay, so so it's like the meta metaverse idea uh, that the seeing, assessing, and counseling and support actually happen in the virtual world with a virtual identity. Okay. Uh, that is supposed to help some patients who are not comfortable with directly talking to new people. Okay. So, so that was uh, either time coaches in China. And other applications, um, AI robots have been used uh, in children with uh, some autistic uh, spectrum disorders uh, to let the uh, children interact. And it has been used quite successfully in uh, training or desensitizing people from uh, fear of heights. I have a little bit of fear of heights. Uh, and it should be quite easy to have a virtual environment uh, to train this or to train children with disruptive behavior, how to behave, how to respond and things. More controversially, sex robots also have been used now for uh, for treating sex dysfunction. Okay, so so as I said, I was wrong three years ago. I thought these are sensitive areas that people would not easily move into. But technology has been technology. It will bring change to uh, very special area. Uh, so uh, the summary of the challenges uh, as AI augments doctor in healthcare. What are the professional obligations? And how will the medical decision making be made? And how will patients be informed before consent? Uh, are some applications of AI intrinsically problematic? Uh, for instance, sex robots or, or avatars for schizophrenia, is it intrinsically problematic? Is it something that 
you should move to a different category to scrutinize it before direct trying it out for implementation. And as we say, mentioned this a long time, how would doctors be accountable? And today we have not covered another issue, which is the other side of the coin. What if AI becomes so good uh, that it's better than the doctors? For instance, leading the grid, would that would it then be negligent not to use AI to screen the grid on patients? Okay? Because they are not giving the patient the best to for treatment. So this question, I think this is high. I, I have a hunch it will be quite a real issue in the next five years or so as AI gets to be good in some area. Uh, so it will be a difficult question to address. As well. So uh, really rushing you, sorry, rushing you through quite a number of different areas in, in AI. Uh, and I don't think this is by no means complete uh, of the issues, but I think it gives a sense of a few things. One, that generally speaking, we now know the issue of ethics and governance in AI, what the issues are. Generally, we know quite well. You can see in WHO, see in European Council, European Parliament, uh, in any informed uh, treatment of the subject is quite similar. Okay? So we know the issues in general. Secondly, we don't quite know what to do with it, some of the issues, the transparent issues, uh, some of the accountability issues and the application issues. We're not quite sure what to do with it. And thirdly, we are even less sure whether eventually AI will really just be augmenting doctors, which I think will not be the case. I think AI will do more than just help doctors. It will undermine certain things in the present mode of relationship, in perhaps in a good way in some areas. Uh, but it will certainly change uh, the way uh, doctors interact with patients. And lastly, some applications gets into perhaps your uh, interest area, get into perhaps slightly the moral agent issue and personhood issue. Uh, at some point, does the middle AI become slightly person with accountability uh, that you have to treat it in a different way than just average technology? I think that's a very philosophical question that is outside that's my, my scope, but it's something that you certainly have been so thank you very much for the invitation and the occasion to share. I can take questions in Mandarin or English, and if you raise a question in Mandarin, I'll briefly try.